Good afternoon. Welcome to Mead Live. Uh, my name is Richard Thompson. I'm the editorial director of Mead. Um, we're going to have a special discussion today looking at the Middle East infrastructure sector. Um, we're going to look at infrastructure across the full range of, of uh, sectors. So um, Jenny Aguinaldo, Mead's transport editor, is here to talk about rail and aviation and ports. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Roscoe, uh, Mead's Power and Water Editor, you're going to talk about renewables and power. And Colin Foreman, Mead's Deputy Editor, you're going to talk about construction and infrastructure delivery. So we have a strong panel to talk about all of these areas. Um, there are a lot of things to talk about, whether it's the financing of infrastructure, whether it's the shift from uh, conventional energy to renewables, or whether it's the privatisation of the uh, transport uh, sector. Please um, take part in the conversation, send in your questions, we will get them on uh, the computer here and we can discuss them uh, and hopefully we can provide you with some good insights and uh, thoughts on what's going on in the Middle East transport and infrastructure sector today. So Colin, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you've been, and actually together with Andrew, you've written some very interesting um, stuff about the public investment fund in Saudi Arabia, the big uh, sovereign fund that's becoming, it's been around since the early 70s, but it's becoming extremely important in the Vision 2030 program. Uh, and you've written particularly in the past week about this super contractor, Aramco and the Public Investment Fund coming together. Could you tell us a little bit about that? What, what, what is this super contractor and what does it mean for construction and project and infrastructure delivery? I mean, I think before we come to that, just to take a step back, I think it's important just to look at the, the infrastructure market as a whole and then that feeds into what's going on with talks about creating their own contractor. I think really the infrastructure market across all sectors has just been in a complete state of flux since 2014, the sort of oil price drop and for various other reasons as well. And what we've had since then is we've had a market which is offering less opportunities. We've had people suffering with payment problems, um, companies going to the wall, companies no longer being able to operate. And that's forced a couple of things to things to change. We're on the front end of things, we're looking at projects being delivered in a different way. So that's PPP, um, contractors bringing in finance, or projects being shelved, or rethought and rethinking on capital expenditure. Meanwhile, we've got all these issues still with a, a supply chain. So we've got a, a market that's off, not offering as much opportunity, and a supply chain that's really been crippled by uh, by lack of payment. What we're seeing coming through now is a move to try and get the get some infrastructure projects moving again. But, but why why the public infrastructure fund, or sorry, the public investment fund? So in the past, you know, it's been the, the, the Saudi Electricity Company or it's been the Ariad Development Agency or yeah. Saudi Aramco. Very, what, what's what's the very, change? I think very simple explanation. I think if you look over the past six months, PIF's been involved with launching quite a number of projects. There was the Red Sea project, the schemes in Medina, there's a scheme in Jeddah, they've also got the entertainment city outside of Riyadh. And if I was anybody doing any work in Saudi Arabia as a developer at the moment, regardless of whether it's PIF or a private developer, my main concern would be, is this thing going to be delivered? Have I got a supply chain that I can rely on? And I think given what's happened over the last three years with payment problems, debts outstanding, very large players, the, the um, Saudi bin Laden and Saudi OJ are, are shadows of their former selves, and that really goes across the, the entire supply chain. My main concern would be delivery. So if you're someone like PIF, you've got billions and billions of dollars worth of things that you need building, probably your number one risk is probably not going to be the normal one that people worry about, which is funding, that, that they should be okay on that, certainly with the Aramco IPO, it's going to be delivery. And I think that's... So this is delivery because so over the past two years, particularly in Saudi, um, there's been such a, a contraction in projects that people yeah, have mean, downscaled. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, supply, the, the supply chain's been torched. I mean, you, you haven't paid the supply chain. It's got a real problem. And if you're looking to now move ahead with projects again, you need some certainty of delivery. So I think this move represents... Um, a broader trend that the supply chain in in the kingdoms just needs to needs to be taken control of if you want to if you want to deliver projects successfully. But isn't that I mean the supply chain can recover? It's it's not like we're overstretched that there's there's no capacity. That they've shrunk because of the drying up of work. Yeah, but they're, they're unable they can to expand quickly. Not really. It's very difficult for a company that's sitting on huge amounts of debt to then move forward. So the, the easier thing to do for, for you as a developer is try and partner with some of the supply chain that's in a, in a healthier position. Um, try and put in some of your own 
um, equity or whatever to try and get the thing going and, and start delivering projects. I mean, there's there's a debate to be had as to, to how successful these client contractor relationships have been in the past in the region. For sure, that's something which has um, got a fairly contentious um, track record. But if you want to get things delivered at the moment, the, the supply chain in Saudi Arabia is really um, not very good. We saw similar things in Dubai in 2011, 2012, when Dubai started to um, restart on projects again after 2008-2009 you know quite a few contractors found it difficult to um, to bid for work and the, the reason being is that a lot of the people that were there mm. um, a lot of the resource was had been redeployed or was no longer available mm. so the supply chain is not something that you can turn off and turn on again and what's happened in the last three years is to a large extent it's been turned off and now we're in a position where let's turn it on again and there's, well, a, I think there's, there's a concern there. Okay, so we've got, there's two parts to this question. You've just talked about turning on the spending taps again. Yeah. So I think I personally would question, are we at that point? Are we now beginning to see the taps coming on again? And then secondly, there's your point about the capacity of the supply chain to deliver. On um, let, Let's finish off on the, the, the supply chain side. So you mentioned uh, Bin Laden Group and you mentioned um, Saudi Oje. They were the giants of the previous boom years and they've, they've um, contracted quite a lot and um, certainly in Bin Laden's case they've had a lot of sort of negative uh, things happening uh, around the, you know, the accident in Mecca or wherever um, but we have seen other contractors emerging so Al Bawani or El Safe Group or Nesma you know some of these ones that weren't as dominant during those years so there is there is change going on in the supply chain but you think it's actually I think, capacity I think has gone yeah, and I, th I think as well, I think most companies who are working for a broad range of clients will have issues on a number of jobs. I think statistically the, the, the problems that you will have on jobs has increased. Mm. And if you're a, a general contracting business, which tends to have quite a broad portfolio of work, you will have problem projects. You know, it's just, it's just the law of averages. So I think everybody will be, will be having difficulties on a number of jobs. It's, not, it, it's very difficult to avoid a, when there's a wholesale... Um, shock to the economy like that it's very difficult for a contractor that's got a, a broad okay. range of clients but to avoid it one of the so one of the uh important elements of current policy in saudi arabia is to, to use local contractors and local staff the sort of the in kingdom value program from what you have just said about the the um downgrading of the local supply capacity in the project sector they're going to have to go international aren't they to bring in you know whether it's chinese or european or american uh, they're going to have to bring in non Saudi companies, which is... Yeah, and I mean, I think that would be the case anyway. I think if you're developing um, very big infrastructure, traditionally you, you have international partners coming in to provide expertise mm. on, on delivery. So that's, I, I don't think that's anything new, and I don't think that really is counter to the, the sort of drive for localization in Saudi Arabia. I think what the, the, the general theme will be going forward is that, yes, we do need international expertise, um, but at the same time, let's try and marry that with um, some elements of localization. So we'll get them to partner with local people, which happens anyway. Um, but try and bring more of those services that the internationals bring into, into the kingdom. So opening up engineering offices, doing more design function in the, the local offices. And we've already seen this in the oil and gas sector with uh, some of the programs that they've deployed to try and stimulate um, the local supply chain there. So I think that's, uh, that's all part and parcel of part and parcel of this program. There's a question mark there again, and, and like like any, any sort of um, scheme or development or program that people implement, there's a question as to how successful that will be, how, uh, whether you can get the right people in Saudi Arabia at the right level, how quickly you can bring them on, whether the, the, the sort of quotas for employing local Saudi Arabians are, are, are realistic or not, all these sorts of things will get worked out over um, the next couple of years. But that's the objective. The objective is to try and develop um, a local industry, and doing that with with the with international partners. And I think they I think they play a very important role, and they continue to play an important role in in every major construction market around the world. There's 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 really nowhere except maybe North America and parts of Northern Europe that rely entirely on their own um, domestic contractors. So you're feeling yeah. on the contracting side. Sorry, Jenny. Yeah, and there's another. Uh, thrust previously where um, the projects that the Saudi, that they fund uh, would also have would also be awarded to Saudi contractors right mm -hmm. like the 
the uh, some roads in Bahrain among others. So that's another that's another um, potentially another source of um, pressure for um, Saudi uh, contractors okay. as well. And so then, I mean, when you 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 you're covering the the transport and infrastructure side of the market, do you have the same concerns as Colin? That um, I, I mean, it, uh, your comments seem to be predicated on an acceptance that spending is starting again. Yeah, I think we're seeing signs of that. I mean, if we look this year, we've had the, the encouraging uh, signs, which uh, Jenny can probably speak a bit more in depth about, about the sort of PPP airport program. So we're seeing it a little bit on the PPP ga gaining traction. There's some, still some concerns about how quickly PPP can be deployed across all different market sectors, but there is movement on the PPP side. And then going back to um, PIF, they've launched these schemes already this year. There seems to be a keen desire to get these things moving quite quickly. In terms of when that's going to happen, general rule of thumb, it's probably going to take a year for them to get sort of consultancy teams, PMs in place, and then a, bit, a little bit more in design before they start looking at early infrastructure. So I would say sort of just applying general rule of thumb, it's probably towards the end of next year that we'll start seeing a, a real pickup in your, actual construction feeling, activity. So PIF, the Public Investment Fund, this is, has been a sovereign fund, a pension fund, if you, if you like, since 1971. It's, it's taken uh, government savings, reinvested them, and, and that money has been used for public sector pensions or salaries or thing. Now it's actually delivering projects. So after 40 years of being a, a fund, we've got the 4.8 billion Jeddah waterfront project, we've got the Red Sea project with people like Richard Branson flying in, in to develop, this is up the coast from from Jeddah, we've got 1.3 million square meter Medina development, it's actually doing projects, what's happened, why is the pension fund now delivering projects? Well it, it's interesting, I mean there's over the last five to ten years there's periodic um, times when a, the, the way economies are forming where people feel in, in the, the, the local market that the sovereign wealth fund should be acting more as an investor in the local market. The counter argument to that is that the sovereign wealth fund should be investing overseas, which gives you a gives you a hedge against your local economy and, and isolates you. Well, they and changed gives the you mandate for PIF, uh, what two years ago, yeah. so that it could invest domestically. So, as well as so I think this is part of that, and I think that I'm second guessing, but I'd be surprised if it's not the case that the, the, there is they've, they've identified that we do need to invest in Saudi Arabia. We do need to catalyze the Saudi Arabian market. And also, it sends, a, it sends out a positive sign for other potential investors. I mean, it, it must be pretty um, difficult to convince people to invest in, in your country if you're not necessarily doing it yourself. So I think it sends out a very positive sign yeah. that, that they think, well, this is what we're doing. We're investing. We've got a lot of money behind us. We're pushing forward with I things. I suppose a lot of the money it, it's going to get is going to be from the privatizations, the airports, or the Aramco IPO. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're bringing that money in, the whole argument is that it's going to come into the Saudi yeah. economy, so yeah. I suppose... Yeah, and, the, and there's a clear need, need for all this stuff, so I, the, I, I don't find that um, particularly um, surprising, really. And I think in terms of time frame, my expectation is towards the end of next year we'll start to see a, a, a pick-up in, um, in construction activity, and then th that should gain momentum through uh, you, 2019. Uh, before I come on to Jenny and Andrew to talk about their sectors, just to finish off this point about contracting capacity. So you have written a story together with Andrew about the Public Investment Fund and Aramco forming a super contractor in Saudi Arabia. Um, what is that because of this concern about uh, supply chain capacity on the on the contractor market, or is is there some other reason? Because Aramco obviously delivers the biggest projects historically; it can do it. I mean, they haven't said explicitly why they're doing it, but like I said. I would imagine that any developer looking to do anything in, in Saudi Arabia at the moment, and to be honest, the same would apply across the region. My One of my primary concerns in, in the case of Saudi Arabia and, and that type of organization, the prime concern would be um, guaranteeing delivery. And I, I think this is becoming increasingly um, important for people. And I think it's going to continue to be an issue. I mean, the supply chain has been lent on very, very heavily over the last three years and you know it's it, it's struggling to it's struggling to deliver in, in many cases and if you've got things that are, are critical that need to be delivered now in the case of Dubai it's an Expo 2020 in the case of Qatar it's a World Cup or in the case of Saudi Arabia it's really socially driven you've got things that you have to build 
then you need to you need to step in and try and uh, try and take some um, control over it. Well, what I'll, uh, I'd like to come back to some of these projects that you've mentioned later on, but let's let's go onto the transport side now. So the public investment fund, they, they are getting they're involved in the airport privatisation, yes. aren't they? So we've got twenty seven airports, all yeah. of them to be privatised in one form or another this year. Yes, this one. Uh, and the revenues from that or the restructured entities go into the public investment fund. For sale, right. is that correct? Um, the ownership, the ultimate owner, owner of the airports will be the public investment fund, and it, it, it I think it, it makes sense, um, um, because eventually some these major airports, a stake in these airports, will be offered to the to private investors or public uh, or the public. So maybe they are looking at um, being able to leverage PIF's um, investment. Um, portfolio or experience um, when it comes to managing these these assets, I think. But um, yes, um, it, it's and and again uh, to Colin's point earlier, there's a there's a tender for uh, twelve airports um, expansion of some of the remaining air airports, and these are not PPPs. They are being procured uh, using conventional method okay. and the list of. Um, is this uh, because the, the qualified bidders so basically have a combination of both local and international contractors? Right. So the Chinese, the South Koreans, and, and the French are invited in, in that tender. Well. The, the, these 12 are being upgraded because they're not ready yet to be privatized. So that's about building the infrastructure around the airport within the airport and, yes, and making exactly. it a more sellable more lucrative, asset. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Make it more bankable. Perhaps. So where does that, the, the um, GACA, the General Authority for Civil Aviation, they have said that they were accelerating their airport privatisation programme so that all of the 27 airports were PPP or privatised or something like that in this year. But if 12 airports are going through an expansion, they aren't going to be ready for privatisation this year. Well, it, it, again, it depends on what they mean by privatisation. Yeah. So, so some yeah, of it's O&M, so some of it, exactly. yeah. Um, um, another interesting news from Saudi Arabia uh, last week was, of course, the um, um, the replacement of the transport minister, um, um, Mr. Al Hamdan. So um, that seems to be a cause of concern for some people in terms of how it might impact some of the ongoing projects. Um, so today, actually, is the submission of bids for the um, consultancy uh, packages for the for the Mecca Metro, Mecca and three other metros in Saudi Arabia. So it's the National um, Center for Privatization, which is um, the client for, for this tender. So it's, it's, I think some people are worried that um, the, the change in terms of the leadership might have an impact in terms of the direction. Mm. Um, probably so the, not, but, but the, there are some concerns. Today is that. the deadline for the advisory bids for financial and consultancy. Financial, technical and legal consultancy. Okay, and so uh, th those bids are going into the National Centre for Privatisation. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, what is the Ministry of Transport's role in the privatisation process or, or well, the de delivery of the metros? Well, NCP is, is as uh, we, we all know, is, is the entity that's um, overseeing all the projects that are being procured using a PPP model, right? But ultimately, it's the Ministry of Transport that would uh, approve um, okay. these projects eventually. Okay, and so what we're worried about, and what do we know about why the change has taken place? Uh, we, we, we have, there's no clarity in terms of why, um, okay. why he was really, well, the, the, the word was relieved, but I think what they meant was he's, he has been reassigned. He used to be the, um, the this uh, chairman of GACA before he became transport minister, and now he's been moved to the civil services ministry. So. Okay, so it's another change. And it's the Saudi government. Ports Authority. It's the former uh, chairman of Saudi Ports Authority who is taking over the post. Okay, and presumably this is part of the whole transformation of government oh. that we have been seeing uh, for two years now. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, where are we then with the airports program? We'll move on to the railways in just a moment, but where, where are we? We've, we've had um, about six airports this year have gone out to PPP operators or have now had... Four were awarded this year. One, of, of course, has been operating in Medina Airport, yeah. so four ha uh, has been awarded. Four PPPs, yes. but we've also had the O&M at Jeddah. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. 
and what's the other one? Is Saudi King Khalid Airport that's gone to? Is it Changi? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's the Jeddah Airport. King okay. Khalid. Yeah. So that's what's been King achieved. Um, yeah. What do we expect to happen between now and the end of the next three months? In terms of the airport privatization, um, well, uh, we're still waiting for the award of a second cargo ha cargo handling license for the Riyadh airport. Uh, so right now it's Saudia cargo handling um, that, that's operating, that is the sole um, service provider in, in Riyadh airport. So I think um, that might be awarded before end of okay. the year. Um, I. I don't expect we don't expect any major awards before before the end of the year because they are still busy in terms of um, um, reaching financial close for the four airports. So so the three airports which were won by um, by uh, Al Raji and and TAV are aiming to close uh, before end of the year, um, and and the other airport, the one the Fort Taif International Airport, is aiming to reach financial close mid next year. So I think. Um, in terms of the aviation assets, there's enough to keep them busy at the moment. Okay. Now, um, we also, uh, we've published this week, Mead has published uh, its Middle East and North Africa rail research report. So you are the, the mother of this report. Mm -hmm. What are the main, you know, rail has gone through a tough couple of years. Mm -hmm. yes. So we've had, you know, three years ago, Railways were the biggest booming sector in the Middle East. We had the Riyadh Metro, the Doha Metro, plans for the Mecca Metro, we had the uh, Dubai Metro, of course, and then there was the GCC Railway and all sorts of things. The oil prices fell, everything went on hold, the metros have been on hold, or uh, no one's known what's going on. Um, you've already mentioned the Metro program going forward with the consultancy bid. So, wh so where is the Middle East railway market at the moment? Is it recovering? Um, or do you think things uh, are going to be on hold indefinitely? Well, it, it's hard. It, it's really hard to tell. But uh, this year it will definitely go down as one of the um, uh, slowest year years ever. Um, we, they've awarded uh, around three billion worth of projects this year. So we're that's on, on the rail side. On the rail side, and we're on the tenth month. Last year they awarded around eight billion dollars. So. Um, so that was the presumably the Dubai metro expansion boosted last year's yes, that's numbers. Yes, right. And, and right. So um, it's what, what we're seeing are small um, movements in terms of how these projects are going to be delivered and structured, especially in Saudi Arabia. Um, but we're also seeing that um, when we published this report two years ago, we came up with an an index to, to sort of assess the opportunities across the various countries in the MENA region. Mm. And um, uh, we one of the parameters uh, in the index uh, is uh, the presence of a PPP framework or a project finance framework. Um, but that doesn't seem to guarantee that projects will take off as we've seen in Kuwait. Because Kuwait has a PPP framework, yeah. but, but they're uh, pushing back. It's not happening. I mean, there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of where if the metro and the rail project will ever take off. Um, but um, yeah, what we're seeing, I think um, there are movements definitely uh, in, in uh, let's say, in du uh, Dubai metro. Mm -hmm. So there's the green line extension and, and the red line extension being being considered. Uh, um, so they, they plan to tender the green line um, extension um, next year. And probably the red line extension from Rashidiya to the UBC center as well. So there are opportunities in Dubai, in Egypt, um, and Tunisia. Um, but uh, what, uh, what about Saudi? You mentioned the uh, the four metros: mm -hmm. the Jeddah, Mecca, Medina, and Damam metros. Uh, the consultancy bids go in today. Mm -hmm. Presumably, that means we've got at least two years to wait yeah. before anything yeah. in terms of construction goes ahead. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so when when they choose uh, um, consultants or advisors, then that will probably take a year or so for for the studies, okay. and then um, and and then it takes time to, to negotiate with, with in terms of the legal and the financial mm -hmm. side of that. So maybe we're looking at twenty nineteen at the earliest. Okay. If so, in terms of the through. railway projects, um, Dubai Metro extension, Green and Red Line extension, is this is this for the um, Expo, Colin? The 
extensions. There's a red line extension which is being built, but there's other red line extensions. Yeah. But these aren't uh, connected to 2020 well. though. No. So this is just ongoing development of the city but and. Okay. Just just to pick up on what Jenny was saying and just to feed back into our original conversation on the supply chain, I think one of the things that was making rail so attractive for companies uh, certainly five years ago is that you had this lovely pipeline. You had Riyadh and Doha being awarded the metros there. Mm -hmm. And then there was the expectation that Mecca would have been awarded, I think it was 2015 yeah, with, uh, originally. 2015, yeah. And then moving on from Mecca, there was things in Jeddah, Medina, yeah. and there was quite a nice pipeline of work for the rail industry. So I think people were looking to invest and, and do quite a lot of projects here over the next 10, 15 years. What we've seen now is that that pipeline really has been thrown into doubt. And we've got an industry that just with Doha and Riyadh, those two together are probably worth what, 40, $45 billion delivered over five years. So you've got eight to $10 billion of turnover on rail projects each year. In two years time, that turnover is gonna drop. Those resources are gonna, particularly on the people side, tend to be quite global. So if there isn't the work in the region, those people are gonna go elsewhere. So they can go to, they can, yeah, they can go to India, mm -hmm. Europe, or, or wherever there might be work. And all of a sudden we'll then look at doing uh, well, could well then be in a position where we're looking at doing rail work again in the region and a lot of that um, regional capability that had been developed, uh, not necessarily from scratch, but a lot of it has to be built up and developed again, whereas before we had a nice, and you could see that with people and the way their careers were going. A lot of people worked on Dubai Metro then finished up there and then moved on to sort of Doha Metro or, or maybe Riyadh as well. And that sort of stepping stone of projects around the region that, that sort of idea is gone really, so it'll be interesting to see how how that reinvigorates itself and, and whether this, how the supply chain adjusts with it. And I think that's a very good example of what's been happening with the supply chain that I think has really applied a, across a number of different market segments. Yeah, so it takes, it's quite quick, the contraction can happen, but it takes time for the, when you pass the worst and start to expand, it takes time to, for the supply chain to catch up. But we still have, according to our Rail report two hundred billion dollars worth of rail projects across the region, a pipeline. Well, yeah, well, You're yes, not. and that that's, those are schemes that were planned um, back uh, two or three years ago or a couple of years ago. Some of them will probably ha will will likely happen. The others will probably never happen. So. Okay. Yeah. So what? What's the outlook? Let's look at twenty eighteen for the railway mm -hmm. market. Then you mentioned Tunisia. You mentioned Cairo Metro. Uh, and you mentioned Dubai Metro. What, is that that's the outlook for 2018 for rail? Is it those uh, those three markets? Well, well, I would suppose so. Uh, where we're looking at or again, the Kuwait we, Metro, we, is that net, or the Kuwait rail project? Um, I don't think. I mean, the, the lack of development over the past year on, on the metro means it's not likely to get to the market next year. So you, we're basically looking at um, some segments of of certain. Uh, mainline rail net network um, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, um, in North Africa as well as well as in Europe. Green Line on Doha Metro. Uh, uh, yeah, the, yeah, that's right. The extension of the Green Line um, Doha Metro is due next month. The the the, ten, the submissions mm. would be due next month. So that that is another potential opportunity. On the Dubai side, I'd personally be very surprised if Dubai moves forward with any pace with any metro until after the expo. Yeah, they've got a lot a lot that they're delivering yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Okay, Andrew, you've sat very quietly. Thank you uh, for your patience. Let's look at renewables. So one sector that has been really booming uh, is the renewable sector. And we've had some massive news out of Saudi Arabia this week. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the, the Mazdar bid and the new world records and things in, in Saudi? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, talking about Saudi Arabia, I think this year uh, there's been touched on you know, the airports, GAC has been quite busy with, with airports, new airports, privatisation. And the only other sector that's really gone to the market is the renewables sector. So there's a, the new body created, uh, RECTO, Renewable Energy Project Development Office under the Ministry of Energy. And that started procuring its first uh, two projects. The bids went in last week for the first utility scale solar plant in Saudi Arabia, 300 megawatts. And there's quite a lot of anticipation on this one because it's the first project of 9.5 gigawatts of projects. And as Colin's touched on, a, a pipeline is, is what's attractive. So although there's been some big renewable projects so far, kind of been dotted about, yeah. between, mainly between Dubai and Abu Dhabi and then some in Morocco. 
So the hope is that Saudi Arabia will kickstart this program and that will provide the supply chain. I mean, the Saudi, the Saudi program is on a different scale to anything we've seen sure. before, isn't it? You yeah. Know, what, do, do we know anything about, you know, in the, in the first round of the Repto projects, we had two projects, it was yeah. about 700 megawatts in total. We've now seen the second round beginning. So yeah, the, the, um, the first, first round was 700 megawatts, two projects. So the bids went in last week for the first one, um, smashed the world records. Again, so following on from Dubai and Abu Dhabi, you know, the, the, the Saudi project broken though. So I think the two lowest bids, uh, the lowest of which is 1785 cents. Uh, and that's cents the Nasdaq bid. That was, so yeah. that's Abu Dhabi bidding yeah. in Saudi Arabia for a yeah. solar project, the lowest prices on um, in history sure. for a renewables project. Is, is that interesting that it's Nasdaq? It's interesting. I mean, Nasdaq broke the world record for the Dubai, it's doing 800 megawatts project in Dubai. So, you know, it's got, it's got experience there and it's obviously got a lot of investment from Abu Dhabi mm. um, there, uh, state investment as well, which it can, it can go forward with. Um, so yeah, Mazda and EDF, the low bid, their second was Aqua Power. So both of those bids beat previous world records. Um, but the Mazda, when it broke the two cents barrier, which was mm. amazing. I mean, if we, if we look back last year um, and the end of the year before, the Dubai 800 megawatts, that broke three cents, whichever at the time was mm. thought, you know, is this sustainable? Uh, then the Abu Dhabi project broke that again. And now Saudi Arabia's, you know, mm. smashed these records so again. How, wh why have they been able to do that? Is that because of technology costs coming down or is it because of this pipeline? Because there's a a view that there's a, enough well, scale of projects coming forward they can people can bid it could, low and it could be a bit of both i mean in terms of the uh sharp fall in renewables cost uh bidding over the last few years technology has played a big part in that so the cost of say the pv panels and modules has gone down by 80 percent uh and the, the part we've seen the last couple of years the other parts so the inverters which companies like GE provide the costs of those have gone down uh the epc contracting costs have gone down. That continue to go down as they get more experienced, mm. particularly in the region. But last year, when we, we had a similar conversation last year, uh, and the view was, as you touched on, that we were getting to a kind of bottoming out of the, the continual sort of lowering and lowering of prices, but yeah. clearly not. Well, that's it. And, and also the, the financing uh, costs have, have been able to uh, be quite reasonable. I mean, low interest rates have helped with that as well. But also, on the other hand, the point you touched on, it's the first project of a massive pipeline. Yeah. So there's a feeling that maybe, you know, the, the bids were low to try and get in there. Set, you know, companies could set themselves up for, for the future phases, put down the marker. So but we'll have to see what happens. But I, mean, I remember the 2015 Dubai 200 megawatt project, when that was awarded, and that was just under six cents kilowatt hour uh, you know everyone then was saying Oof, I don't know if that's <laughs> achievable and now we're, we're under two so I think yeah I think there does come there will come a time when it's you know that's the bottoming out um, but I think yeah and also I think it's important that every market's different you know so Saudi this massive pipeline you know you'll have secure off takers there as well recognized utilities the financing they've got attractive financing terms still um, which other markets in the Middle East will mm. be quite as attractive, but yeah. Okay, so we've had the, the um, from phase one of the renewables program, we've had the two, yeah. the solar and the wind project, and we've got the world record, you know, bids going in for the solar, and we've got the world record lowest bid. Uh, phase two, what's the status with that? So the, the second project, and the first phase of the wind, the bids are due in January. That was delayed a bit as they changed the location. The next phase... And is the wind as important as the solar? So we've, we've been talking about the, the solar cost coming down and there's obviously in this region solar is the big opportunity because of yeah. the climate. Uh, is wind so significant? Well, I think, I think wind's important. You know, we've, we've talked about wind before, uh, primarily in countries like Egypt. Mm. They've got a lot of wind there. Saudi Arabia on the, the Red Sea coast and in the northern parts has a lot of wind as well. Mm. Countries like Dubai... It's all about solar here. It doesn't have the same wind mm. um, resources as other countries. Mm. Okay, they're looking at it in Oman and the southern part of Oman as well, but I think that's why I haven't seen as much 
the wind yet because UE doesn't have the same mm. wind resource. There's parts of the UE uh, out in Rasul Kaima, for example, in Fujira, where they, they get more wind. Mm. It's primarily been solar focused. So I think, yeah, the wind will, the wind will play an important part okay. in this in the side. In terms of the next phase, that will be just over a gigawatt. So I think it'll be 620 megawatts of solar at various sites. What, and when is the next phase? Well, they're supposed to, they said they were hoping to start it by the end of the year. Nothing's yeah. come out yet. So I think they may, might wait and see how they how quickly they can close. Will that be one one. wind project, one solar project again? I think one four hundred megawatt wind project, and the solar will be six hundred and twenty over a few sites, over a few projects. And so, is there a for this renewables program in Saudi? The, the end point is um, uh, was it forty five gigawatts by twenty thirty or something like that, isn't it? Uh, well, the, the original target in Saudi was for, for over fifty gigawatts by twenty thirty two. The revised target they brought out last year. It was 9.5 gigawatts, and they've since put a timeline for 2023. So that's, yeah, the 9.5 is 2023, and then there was a bigger target for it, but we, we're focusing on the 9.5. Yeah, they or, sort of dropped that bigger target okay. to 9.5. And by 2020, it was 3.45 gigawatts yeah. or something. So, and so at the moment, we've got 700 megawatts with yeah. tenders in. Now, it's going to be a challenge. It's to, quite a long way to it's go. It's going to be a challenge to meet that. I mean, even the solar tender, the, the bid deadline was delayed a bit for that. Mm. And it's just sort of getting the programme started, there's okay. going to be some initial delays. And does it, I mean, Colin and Jenny have both touched on the, the supply chain bottlenecks or potential yeah. for supply chain bottlenecks. If if we've, we're a bit behind on getting the renewables off and running, we're still on the first 700 megawatt solar project and we have to get 3.4 gigawatts by within three years. Mm. Um, that's, a, that's a big ask. Is there going to be a kind of sudden late rush to bring all these projects to the market in 2019 and not enough capacity to deliver? Uh, there, there could be. So I think, yeah, in terms of you've got the physical you know, constraints of capacity, but also in terms of the power sector, because it's IPPs, um, that's going to be strain on the, the financial capacity. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that, you know, some of the banks are saying and the developers are saying, bring all these projects on. So you've got the renewable, but also Saudi Arabia's planning large conventional plants as well. Uh, gas yeah. fires plants. So if they all come on, yeah, using time, using IWPPs or yeah, IPP models, it's going to be you know that could be a challenge as well getting the financing together. So for, from your point of view, it's the biggest. Um, we, we've got one of the the challenges is just getting the projects to market. So at the government side, bringing schemes to the market. But after that is the challenge about finance. I think that will be key. Yeah, the financing will be the uh, the, the big challenge. Um, and also, I think we're going to see more of a move for alternative financing as well. So we're going to see more export credit-backed uh, loans and financing. Um, we're going to see maybe shorter-term loans. So most of the IPPs we've seen so far in the region have been on long tenor loans, 15, 20 years. Mm. As banks, you know, you know, become the capacity or liquidity become more of a challenge. Sorry, um, I think there'll be more, more of an appeal for shorter term loans, banks okay. will be more comfortable with those. We've seen That'll some put the pricing up a little bit then. A little bit, but then you know, there'll be, you know, for refancing, opportunity for refancing and going into the bond market. So we've seen the Murfa in Abu Dhabi as a mini perm structure, and I think that that will become more, more of a theme as well. Shorter term loans because the international banks, you know, that I think they're losing interest in such long term loans moving forward. So I think mm. more mini mini perm okay. structures will be. So we have, you're chairing or moderating a conference on Monday with GE. Yes. Uh, and that is looking at the transforming the power sector. Yeah. Um, that is in Dubai. Um, is this, this is what we're going to be looking at on, at that conference, is it the financing yeah. of power projects? So I think, yeah, the, the conference is going to look at the sort of the few main trends in the power market and themes. Diversification, which we've touched on, so renewables um, and also other forms of power, we've got coal and nuclear looking to diversify away from oil and gas. Uh, you've got efficiency, and that's on supply and demand side, so that's improving existing power plants, improving efficiency of the next ones, also digitalization of the market, how that will improve efficiencies. And third, the finance, which underpins all of that, and that's part of the broader shift we're seeing across the market, where it's a move away from government EPC contracts towards privately financed IPPs or even EPC plus finance for the fine, the, um, for gas power. You touched on the export 
you know, you, you mentioned the need for, for new sources of funding and alternative funding, and you touched on export credit. Is, it, is that this is going to be the big moment for China? Do you think so? You know, they have China has the one belt one road policy, and you've you've been writing about one belt one road. Um, where does the is the Gulf important for Chinese um, outward investment, and is Saudi renewables is that one of the target well, areas? Do you think? I think yeah. In, in terms of the power market, we're we're starting to see that. So Dubai's coal plant, that's the Chinese. So that's aqua power developing with the Chinese. Most of the financing is coming from, from China on that one. Um, and also, for the lowest bid, um, the Dubai CSP solar project, we've got a Chinese firm in there. So I think, yeah, we'll see more Chinese financing uh, in the power sector, for sure. We get, and, and from your research in this area, do you, think, um, do you think One Belt, One Road is going to be, or One Road, One Belt, is going to be the um, quite a significant driver of well, the finance or... Uh, we've seen um, a le uh, an example would be Abu Dhabi, of course, the terminal, uh, second terminal in Abu Dhabi will be operated by the Chinese and they have are investing in, in, in a certain um, zone in, in, in the economic zone around the port as well. So I think apart from, I think that's one, one part, that's one side of a strategy where um, where the broader uh, where the broader objective would be to find market for for their surplus capacity and and, and, mm. and a market for your product so it, it it works both ways so so the regions um, the ports or the other um, the uh, most countries in the region would like to benefit directly or indirectly from um, one belt one road if it does happen and at the same time um, the Middle East market mm. remains an important one for 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 all of Chinese uh, yeah. uh, sectors. Certainly, as well. Egypt is what is getting a lot of Chinese investment and uh, across yeah. North Africa. Um, before we move on to, to other topics, still on the subject of renewables or other energy sources, mm -hmm. we've also seen uh, this um, waste to energy project in in Dubai moving forward this week. We've got. Um, we're at sort of a clarification stage of the bidding round. What, what, yeah. How significant is that project? Well, that's it's, it's significant. I think we're, solar projects have, have started um, in the region, um, either been completed or under bidding. Uh, we've, we've had wind projects as well in, in North Africa. Waste to energy is sort of the next phase. Um, so this is collecting municipal waste yeah. and burning it, converting it into electricity. Into electricity. So yeah. yeah. One, that you're disposing of waste. Uh, you're not just filling a landfill, but two, you're creating electricity from it as well. Uh, so the Dubai one, well, that'll be the first large-scale one in the Gulf. Um, so that's, that'll be interesting to see you know, what, what price that goes ahead with. And what's been happening, so in your story this week on mid.com, you, you talked about, uh, is that um, Abgen, uh, Abgen Goa has become the lower or the front runner for that. Previously, it was the Chinese consortium that was yeah. the front runner. What, what's going on? Well, in when the bids went in initially, the, the Chinese uh, company contractor Sepco 3 was the lowest bidder. Um, and then they had to do technical evaluation and then they asked for fresh prices. Fresh bids went in and then Abu Goa uh, from Spain submitted the lowest one. So that's still, it's in the clarification stage now, but that's I, I always think of them as a solar contractor. They do a lot of waste to energy. Yeah, they? they do waste to energy and, and you know conventional power as well. Um, so that will be that will be interesting. See how that project goes along. I mean, Abu Dhabi had one plan planned previously, which hasn't materialised yet. And Kuwait, Kuwait is also working on a big Kuwait, waste to energy project. Kuwait's working on one as well. I think Saudi um, Arabia. I think there's a plan for Saudi Arabia as well with Bia. So yeah, the future. Future round of the renewables in Saudi will have waste to energy, on top okay. waste to energy as well. Uh -huh. So, and so those tend to be presumably based around municipalities, you know, urban areas where there's a lot of urban waste and yeah. municipal waste. Yeah. Whereas so, the solar and the renewables will be, and the wind will be out in more remote areas. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting. The Dubai one is an EPC project, so mm. government financed contract. Uh, the Q8, it, it's part of its PPP program there, yeah. so it's interesting to see. Well, were they, where are they with the Kuwait one? They, they'd received bids, have Received bids, and I think they've selected an approved bidder for that okay. as well. But it's, I think it'll be March next year before they, okay. the 
contracts are voided. Okay. I think Andrew touched on a, another important issue when we were talking when you were talking about PPP or IPPs and just the, the resource available. I mean, uh, you are right to highlight liquidity. I think that's something that's um, obviously a concern. But I think also just the amount of projects that are planned to go down that route, that there's an, an enormous strain going to be on the sort of financial services and legal profession to try and get all this stuff happening. And I think really the amount that's being flagged up as being a potential PPP, I just don't think can possibly all be delivered just from a, a logistics point of so view on a, on a PPP the, basis. The soft infrastructure, the legal systems. Yeah, it's, the, it's the professional services supply chain, really. There's just not enough people to do all that. And so it so comes, it, you've mentioned supply chain bottlenecks. Yeah. I don't know how many times it, in today's discussion. Yeah, on a scratch record, but, but I think it's... Down. How can we have supply chain bottlenecks? The, 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 there isn't the, 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 the regional resource for it. And on the PPP side, I think you're, you're compounding the problem. Um, do you have other markets uh, around the world looking at PPP as well at a time when they're struggling to get projects over the line? So in the US, for example, there's a, there's a keen drive to use PPP. All of this is going to be competing for the same resource. So getting a lot of these things over the line, I think, is going to be a, a, going to be a real challenge. One of the um, attractors to this region for a lot of international businesses, traditionally, is the fact that it moves faster. So when they decide they want to do an airport or a... I don't know, a power plant or something, the decision-making process in here is not held back by red tape and public consultation and all of that sort of thing. Are you saying because we are um, making this transformation into different financing models and the privatisation, actually we are going to see projects take longer to get off the ground as we do in Europe? So I, 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 personal view, I think that I think there's too many things being put down as being PPPs. They can't all be uh, pushed forward at the same time. They're going to have to be. It's going to have to be a phased rollout, yeah. and and that's going to uh, that's going to change how things are done. Well, it's funny. So Jenny mentioned in her index, the Rail Project Index, that one of the scoring criteria was the existence of a, a PPP framework or a PPP no, entity, yeah. and Kuwait has all of that. They've been ahead of everybody for with that, but yet they're struggling more than anybody to get their PPPs off the ground. So there's other factors as well, aren't there, than just having the... Yeah, and, course, and, and I don't think liquidity is the other one. I mean, liquidity is the other one. And well, I think the, got no problem with liquidity. The, the, other, the other issue as well is that a lot of these things, you know, market soundings and things, some of that's been done. We know on the power sector it seems to be attractive. People do come in and invest on the power side. We don't know the answer for a lot of the other types of assets that people want to privatise, you know, and, and we're only really going to find out once a few of these schemes go ahead. So that's another. So it's that's the, another. The, the the power sector. I mean, it's it's succeeded in PPP historically because you have a guaranteed offtake or a guaranteed feedstock price. In the other ones, you have to build the commercial model from much less predictable yeah, sources. And, and the answer is we don't know, yeah. um, and you know we'll we'll find out. Um, even when it happens, and if it is successful, then that should build momentum. But, but oh, you, so, have you changed your tactics? So you've always been quite cynical about, or not cynical, sceptical about PPP outside of the electricity sector. It sounds like you now um, believe all, that it is a key part of the, the market going forward, well, of course, it's not of course. just rhetoric I mean, anymore. It's a lot of people talking, there's an awful lot of stock being put into it. I think we have seen progress. We've certainly seen progress on the airports. We've seen a few other examples. I think it will still disappoint, given the amount of projects that have been put into the PPP basket. I don't think we'll see anywhere near the amount of projects coming out that have, have, that have been uh, assigned to being PPP. Mm. I, I think we'll, I think we'll see some, and a, a, and some is better than none, and that, and that's positive. But I don't think it will be. Close to the amount and the fact that you bring touted. in a lot more players like like investors and and um, um, banks, uh, it means that the projects that are most likely to go through would be the ones that will generate revenues um, um, in exchange uh, of uh, the risks that's that's involved. So Do you think that means so a lot of our focus on PPP has mm -hmm. been about the big capital projects? How are we going to deliver an airport or a railway or a metro? But they have much bigger risks in terms. You know, you're talking about the the risk allocation and the risk model. The the more lucrative contracts would be the municipal services and the stuff that's less glamorous, I guess. So is that where PPP might have more? You know, waste to energy might be a good example where you're actually providing municipal waste collection. Well, I think there was a very good point raised by Andrew several um, uh, web webinars ago, and he said it depends 
um, it all depends on the need, especially for the people. If they need a project, then they will find a way to, mm. uh, to, to finance it and, and, and to find the right structure for those projects, I guess. So, um, well, so, so airports, for instance, are more than infrastructure. They are a commercial entity, I, or at least that's what they want them to be in the future. Look at uh, Dubai, for instance, uh, Dubai Airport. So um, there's there's a commercial there's a uh, there's a potential economic incentive um, for 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 the private sector uh, to be part of, of an airport project, but uh, right now that's that's not exactly the same um, the same argument that you can apply to, to some rail projects. For sure, there are some rail projects that might um, that might be success that might be managed as a PPP, but um, some it might not work. So okay. I think, as well, another challenge which sort of feeds into everything we've been talking about uh, from localization to capacity is uh, the renewables program in Saudi, a good example of this. They have set in the first round 30% local content and there was also requirements that you needed to have local financing, a certain percentage of local financing as well. So it's okay having these requirements in place to ensure you're getting local content. Mm. But when this project's coming, you know, out to the market thick and fast then that's going to have further capacity constraints mm. um, uh, you know and that's you might need to choose choose what, what and, happens yeah then. and I think uh, for the non I uh, for the non power non water uh, projects that are being um, that are all being structured or being planned to be structured as PPP um, I think uh, the, uh, the, the, there needs to be uh, they need to be more circumspect in terms of these projects because, well, there's a project here and then we all say, oh, we need funding, so let's do it as a PPP. So we're basically using PPP as, as, a, as a potential solution for every fund, nearly yeah. every funding yeah. issue. And that's not how it works elsewhere. I mean, even elsewhere where there, there's proper structure and there's proper framework, some projects still struggle to take off. So I, uh, one consultant was telling me that, you know, everyone's looking for money. That, that's basically the point for, for most PPPs in the region today, not all but for many. And that might backfire over over the long term because mm. that's not, you don't... It's the wrong motive. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's probably... Or it's too much emphasis on that uh, one motive, uh, you know. Yeah. Okay, we've got two minutes to go. Um, I want to go around the three of you with a view on outlook for 2018 in your sector. So I'll start with you. Jenny, we've talked about airports, we've talked about railways, we've talked about PPP. Uh, what's your feeling on, and, and you touched on the, how difficult 2017 has been in terms of contract awards. What's your view for um, the year ahead? How are we coming out, uh, as, as the IMF and the economists are saying, are we coming out of the downturn, things will pick up next year? Do you see more rail projects being awarded, more airport projects being awarded? Oh, well. Um, given for the past two years, the annual uh, contracts value uh, award um, has been about eight or seven billion in the real sector. So that's really a small portion of the overall projects market. Um, will will it be any different next year? It's it's really hard to tell, especially if they're all going. Most of them are going through the PPP route. Then we we don't see an abrupt change or an abrupt improvement next year it, it probably will happen but not likely i don't think okay so if if everything else stays the same oil prices stay as we expect in the current price band um you think next year we're still going to see a lot of delays because of the, the you know the creating the legislation or mm -hmm. the capacity to deliver ppp um, well um maybe it will no longer that then the delay is now the new normal maybe it's you're looking at, let's say, for the projects in Saudi Arabia, they've already stopped talking about target completion dates. So, so for the four metro projects, for instance, um, the, the, uh, it, it appears that they will start with one, maybe Mecca Metro. So once that's completed, and that, that would take four or five years, then maybe they will move on to the next one. So it, it's going to be a gradual, um, okay. gradual uh, improvement, I think. Okay. over the next few years. Okay, and what about for you, Andrew? I'm guessing that 2018 is going to be a really big year for renewables. And let's focus on the, the GCC initially. What, what's your view on what's going to happen in the power sector next year? So, yeah, I, I think 2018, carrying on from 
for them this year and, and last year, there's going to be a definite uh, step up in renewables capacity, projects coming to the market. I think if you look at the power, power market overall, it's a bit of a slower this year this year in terms of major contract awards, this is conventional power as well, and it's, it sort of comes in cycles, the, the power market. Um, so I think we'll, we'll see more a step up in awards next year. A big part will be Saudi Arabia, which has spent a lot this year uh, reorganising the structure or re-evaluating which projects are, are necessary. So we'll see some of those coming to the market, renewables being part of that. Might see nuclear power coming to the market there as well. You think so? Next year, when yeah. When you say coming to the market, you mean consultancy? Consultancy uh, contracts coming out to the market next year. Um, what other, do we know about the Saudi nuclear program at the moment? It's well, no, not much. They've, they've, they've sort of revealed some plans. Uh, they're going to have a, an initial uh, three gigawatt plant. They haven't chosen the location for that yet. So I think that they'll be maybe tendering the consultancy for that next year. They're also looking at small modular reactors. They yeah. signed an agreement with uh, South Koreans to do to do that as well. This is for remote locations, remote, remote locations and things. Yeah, so not much yet. Might see a start of that next year. Renewables, also big conventional plants. Other markets in the GCC we haven't talked much about this year, such as Bahrain, uh, Qatar. We've got uh, they'll be awarding major projects next year. Big IWPPs, Q8. You know, hasn't really delivered this year. Its big project was cancelled. A number of other power projects were were shelved as well. So I think we might see that market. Uh, well, it'll have a better year. Than, this year, that's for sure. So I think yeah, we'll see see a big pickup in awards next year, generation projects, and that will feed into networks, transmission, distribution uh, contracts as well. So. Okay, okay. Just calling on to you. So I know what you're going to say. Supply chain bottlenecks. Not so much bottlenecks. I, I don't think there's uh, enough uh, the supply chain risk there. I think just broadly speaking about markets. I think Dubai is going to be flat to softening next year. I think Saudi Arabia show, shows signs of improvement. Qatar you, is still point, progressing, so Saudi, but operationally difficult. On, on the paper, Saudi is the biggest market with the most opportunities. It's got the, all the oil and the population. It's not been the biggest market for the past two years. What you just said, where do you think it's got potential to pick up next year? Will no, it be back I said, to the I top said, of the pile? I, no, or? I said I think we'll see signs of improvement. I don't think it will be. Okay. I don't think it will be a particularly busy market next year. I think we're seeing signs already that things are starting to be put in place at the very top level in terms of announcements and intentions to do things. I think we'll see those intentions moving towards actual projects next year and maybe towards the end of next year we'll see them as actual projects. But do you I, think the two outside of the electricity sector and the airport sector, do you think Public Investment Fund and Aramco, those are the two key entities that we should all be tracking? Yes. For, for projects? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then you touched on, before I interrupted you, you were touching on Qatar with its current political crisis. If that, what's that going to mean? Operationally very difficult. I think what's going on with the, the political um, environment will make Qatar, Qatar traditionally is quite a confrontational market anyway to work in. I think it will just make that even more of an issue um, for delivering work in Qatar. So I can see operationally it being very difficult for people working so in Qatar. confrontational in terms of the way the clients and contractors relate yeah, to one another. Yeah. Uh, Oman, I think, will continue to be a difficult market. Bahrain's small, but still offering opportunity, and possibly some more work in Kuwait, but Kuwait tends to okay. um, be a little slow. Dubai is still the hotspot? Yeah, I mean, I think the question to ask about Dubai is Dubai's uh, really bucked the trend over the last three years. A, a lot of work that, uh, has come through. I think Expo not necessarily been the... The, um, the reason for all that work, but I think it's been a driver for a lot of work. question then is, uh, as the nearer we get to Expo, the, the rationale for awarding work might not be as strong. And, and I think we see a lot of government agencies now have, have let quite a lot of work and are busy delivering work for the Expo. So take the RTA, for example, the Road Transport Authority, they're doing the Metro. They've let four or five interchanges this year for, to support um, the Expo site. Have they, have they got the the, um, the budget or the capacity to, to let more work next year. Um, there's a few things that they look like they should be moving towards tendering, but I don't think they'll um, be letting as much work as they have done over the last couple of years. So I see it levelling off a little bit. In, uh, okay. leveling off a little and bit Abu Dhabi? Bit. Abu Dhabi continues to be slow. I think there's quite a bit of work on the, the sort of lower end of the construction market. A, a lot of um, 
sort of smaller projects going ahead. The midfield terminal is obviously the main uh, construction slash transport project that's been going on over the last few years. That's been delayed and uh, still uh, to be completed. So I think that really until that starts to get finished, I don't see them moving ahead with a big um, lump of capital expenditure. The thing that everybody talks about consistently in Abu Dhabi is what's happening with the, the, the light rail or metro that's planned. I still think we're, a, if, if things go well, I still think we're a couple of years away from, from that happening, which will tie in with that sort of met, uh, midfield terminal at the airport um, completion date that they're working to at the moment. Yeah, okay. and overall it will probably be a very, very busy year for the consultants next year. Uh, legal, okay. technical, um, financial consultants, because of all these PPP projects. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's, we're out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to end on that positive note for consultants. Thank you very much for joining us today for Mead Live. Um, just a quick reminder, Transforming Power that Andrew mentioned is a conference that Mead is doing together with GE in Dubai on Monday. You can find out details on mead.com. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, panelists, for thank being you. with us. See you next time.